why? Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp and welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's video is sponsored by Built Bar and we are going to be discussing the UK show Super Size versus Super Skinny. But first, let's talk about my sponsor, Built Bar. So I think I said this last week, but I got sent these bars in December and, and I had them totally ruled out in my mind as something I would absolutely hate. But I tried one and I immediately texted my agent right away being like, these things are so good. So today's snacky snack little flavor is gonna be this one. Banana bread, I've been dying to try this one. So let's give it a little quick taste test. Tastes like banana bread wrapped in chocolate. Mmm, this is good. Honestly, I would not care if these were straight up chocolate bars. I would probably still be here talking about them because they taste so good. They taste like the love child between a marshmallow and a nougat bar. Also, you know I have to laugh at the zero guilt label on the package, which I think is a super hilarious marketing claim because remember folks, unless you stole it, all foods are zero guilt. Put that on your pantry door and remember it. But anyways, nutrition wise, each bar has 17 grams of protein. So I like them for adding to like a snack or a meal to bump up the satiety factor. And since they are lower in sugar, if I were to have this as a post-workout snack, I would always pair it with some fruit or like a piece of toast to balance the protein with the carbs and natural sugars. To me, the most important thing about a snack is that it's satiating and satisfying. And this definitely checks those boxes for me. So if you wanna try them, you can check out the link in the description for 20% off of your order. Also, you can check out my disclaimer here on screen, so feel free to pause the video to read it or check it out in the description below with a big trigger warning, like the biggest one for this video. This may be disturbing to my followers with disordered eating tendencies, so please feel free to skip this video if this does not support your journey. And also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that little bell so that you never miss out on a video. All right, folks, snack time's over because I'm probably going to make somebody crazy with my chewing. So let's get down to business. Now, if you haven't heard of this dumpster fire of a show, Super Size versus Super Skinny, it was a British television program that aired for seven years between 2008 and 2014. And if you ask me, it was seven years too many. Now, to give you a brief summary of the show, the show pairs up one larger bodied individual, AKA the supersized, with one smaller bodied individual, AKA the super skinny. So yeah, we are off to a pretty inhumane start, considering that the entire show hinges on pathologizing people based on their body size. Cool. Anyways, these two poor souls meet at a feeding clinic run by Dr. Christian Jensen, where they're weighed and insensitively shamed. Let's take a look. Hi. Come and meet each other. Hello. Daryl weighs 33 stone. Yeah. Daryl, this is Yasmin. Okay. She weighs seven and a half stone. Right. This means that we could fit four of her into you. What the actual if this isn't evidence of insensitive fat phobia in the healthcare community, I don't know what is. I think I'm gonna need like a, a, a drink to watch this show. Anyway, after this friendly little introduction, the participants move into the feeding clinic for five days where they're forced to swap diets. The intro of season one explicitly says, Dr. Christian Jessen will be stuffing the super skinny and starving the supersized. How the f did this show even get approved? I think we better just dive straight into my five reasons as to why the show should have never aired on TV because I have to drive home after this and I'm gonna try not to get too riled up. Reason number one, the sole goal of the show is to manipulate weight or BMI, not improve health. Now in each episode, Dr. Jensen's goal for the two individuals is to either lose or gain weight for the big dramatic final weigh-in. Ugh, of course it is. 
I am really so over this common weight loss transformation show trope, incorrectly suggesting that physical body changes are the most important indicators of a diet's success when we know that metabolic health can improve even without budging the scale. But of course, seeing improvements in your blood pressure or A1C doesn't drive ratings like dropping those dramatic LBs. Unfortunately, Dr. Johnston isn't the only professional on the show that I feel like reporting to their regulatory board. In the first season, holistic nutritionist Gillian McKeith parades around the UK on a mission to reduce the size of the nation's rears, holding a sign that says, ban big bums. Honestly, I can't make this up. Ban big bums! And fearsome fat fighter Gillian McKeith crusades against the nation's big bums. Show me your bums! Why? Why? If that wasn't bizarre enough, she then has a group of women try out a bunch of bum tightening gadgets and creams, measuring their bums before and after the month long trial to see how many inches they lost. These experiments are just so bizarre. I need to know where their research teams even found some of this stuff. They have them shocking their behinds with electricity, cycling in a vacuum pod that sucks your body, and smudging clay all over themselves to remove toxins from their ass. This sh makes goop look like the CDC. Anyway, I am not really sure why a holistic nutritionist is promoting the use of expensive random gadgets and creams that have really no scientific backing to spot reduce the size of women's behinds. Not only does this seem totally out of scope for a woman of her education and training, but I do not understand the focus on bums in the first place. Research suggests that gluteofemoral fat, AKA that pear shape, actually may have a protective role by reducing bad LDL cholesterol, raising good cholesterol, improving insulin sensitivity and blood sugar levels. So yeah, generally speaking, the fat in your ass is not a major health concern. Also, I know that this is all for dramatics and sensationalism sells on TV, but my goodness, this woman's counseling skills are appalling. Running around poking women's bums, telling them that they feel squishy? Is that something that you would want your nutritionist doing in session? I think not. And while I get that some people respond to a tough love approach, research suggests that body shaming only makes people sicker and heavier in the long term. Moving on, reason number two this show is truly the worst is that it relies on fat phobic shock and shame tactics to encourage people to lose weight. There are so many examples of this I can't even keep track, including some of the points I already made about the show. But in later seasons, they fly the larger bodied individuals from the UK to the US to meet some morbidly obese individuals for what they call a terrifying glimpse into their future. Let's take a look at the supersized man's response. Do you think the memory, the picture of Jeff in his bed like that, really unable to do much at all, let's face it, you know, is, do you think that's going to stick with you? In in crying in distress of what's happened to him. I mean, it's enough to deter anyone. This has totally shocked me. Good. That, cool. that was the point. Yep. Shock value is always the point of good TV. Interestingly, while the premise of the show pits the super size against the super skinny participants, the latter never are subjected to the same body shaming fear factor experience, even though arguably, their health is in equal, and in some cases, even greater danger. Now, reason number three that this show sucks is that it's extremely triggering for individuals struggling with disordered eating and eating disorders at both or all ends of the weight spectrum. First, the show erroneously suggests that disordered eating is only an issue in the super skinny individual, when we know that this can and does affect people across the weight spectrum. In fact, while I'm not going to attempt to diagnose any of the participants on the show, there's a good chance that their supersized participants are also struggling with problematic food tendencies. 
It's important to remember that weight is not always a defining criterion for an eating disorder. But unfortunately, individuals who are normal weight or are overweight may be led to believe that because they're not underweight, that they're not sick enough to have an eating disorder. The result is that normal weight individuals may be really struggling, but are barred from seeking out professional support needed for recovery. Now the show also overlooks the fact that eating disorders are actual mental illnesses. They're not just the result of a lack of nutrition education. In fact, most people with eating disorders have a tremendous nutrition knowledge base. I mean, there's a reason why disordered eating is statistically rampant amongst nutrition students and interns. But force feeding a chronic under eater huge portions of food for a few days in effort to immediately stimulate an appreciation of eating is both ill-informed and arguably quite dangerous. Now, I also took a look at Reddit, quite bravely, I might add, to see what kinds of things people were saying about the show online. Honestly, it's exactly what I expected, but worse. And trigger warning, like huge trigger warning here, folks. I heavily suggest skipping this section if you are susceptible to disordered eating tendencies. So the first forum submission reads, anyone else feel super guilty using my 600 pound life or super size versus super skinny as fats though? I binge watch these shows when I wanna eat and somehow it helps me. I'm basically viewing these people as everything I don't wanna be. Whenever I'm starving, I watch Amberlynn Reed compilations and it helps me restrict. And now when I'm just restricting, I can't help watching super size versus super skinny and wanting to be the skinny one when their eating habits are just as bad. Another reply reads, I unconsciously want to be like the underweight person, even though I know that's really bad. And another saying, doesn't matter if he's 10 centimeters taller or heavier, at least my waist and ribs are smaller. Again, skip ahead if you want. This is triggering for me too. Now another problematic forum I found titled Reverse Thinspo reads, when I see the supersized diets, I'll be like, I will never eat that much and I don't wanna turn out like them, then I restrict. On the other hand, I'll compare the super skinny's diets to mine and feel like I'm not trying hard enough and I end up wanting to restrict even more. It's horrible and the ED will never let us win. And finally, another Reddit post reads, watching super size versus super skinny and writing down all the foods the super skinny eats in a full day to create my new meal plan. Yeah, so this pro-Anna rhetoric inspired directly from the show and its themes continues for pages and pages on end. I am literally just scratching the surface here. But these threads paint a clear and problematic picture of how this show directly inspires people who are struggling with disordered eating to restrict their intake out of disgust and fear for how the supersized individual is portrayed while comparing their own intake with and aspiring to be as restrictive as the super skinny. By focusing on this unhealthy dichotomy and avoiding the opportunity to teach real balance, this show teaches vulnerable viewers absolutely nothing about healthy eating. In fact, it actively only offers displays of unhealthy eating as a how-to horror show about trading one eating disorder for another. And this brings me to reason number four why the show should have never aired. The show does not promote realistic behavioral changes. When the participants are in the feeding clinic, they're not given a realistic individualized diet for healthy weight loss or healthy weight gain. They're told to eat a diet so extremely different than what their body and palate is accustomed to, there is no way in hell anyone could reasonably expect it to be sustained. Then at the end of their stay in the feeding clinic, Dr. Jensen provides participants with a meal plan in an ominous red folder, suggesting that they follow it strictly over the next 12 weeks to gain or lose weight in time for the final weigh-in. Shockingly, the show never really explores the plan in detail as education for viewers at home. So for all I know, it could be the same over the top unrealistic bull they're being fed or starved of 
in the clinic. All the doctor seems to emphasize is the importance of changing their weight before they come back. Obviously, in real life, any credible healthcare provider would make sure a client be sent home with proper education on reading labels, balancing food groups or macronutrients, and realistic portions of different kinds of foods. But alas, this social experiment is so far from real life, it is amazing they got real humans to sign up. I also found Jillian McKeith's nutrition education contributions super bizarre and also really ill-informed. While she never actually interacts with the two participants in the feeding clinic, and maybe that's for the better, she instead is featured in a section of the show surveying random people in public about bum-slimming gimmicks. And then like in another episode of What the F*** with Jillian McKeith, three shirtless men hold three different dishes while random people in public settings guess which is highest in calories. But what's strange to me about this is that instead of them making adjustments to those meals or suggesting ways in which you could easily make them more well balanced or satiating or increasing the amount of veggies, she just recommends completely different low calorie meals. Like, Talk about lazy and ineffective nutrition counseling. Finally, reason number five that this show is truly the worst is that its premise is not only not health promoting, but it's actually potentially dangerous. Like really, really dangerous. So dangerous, I have no clue how this show got past ethics approvals. Let's remember that the two participants are forced to swap diets, resulting in the super skinny taking in a dramatic increase in calories and the super size virtually starving. Why is this so dangerous? Well, when we see a drastic increase in calories overnight, we worry about something called refeeding syndrome. Now, refeeding syndrome occurs after a state of undernourishment when calories are introduced too much and too fast. It's actually incredibly dangerous due to sudden shifts in electrolytes with symptoms ranging from fatigue, weakness, confusion, inability to breathe, high blood pressure, seizures, heart arrhythmias, heart failure, coma, and even death after just four days of refeeding. And then on the flip side, it can be really dangerous to drastically cut calories for somebody who is used to eating a lot more. Severely reducing caloric intake can result in nutrient deficiencies, extreme fatigue, muscle loss and metabolic declines, and so much more. And that is not even touching on the likelihood of a binge. Now, before we end off, I just want to mention that the UK actually released one season of Super Size versus Super Skinny Kids. So let's take a look, if you dare. Super Size versus Super Skinny is back and this time with an urgent mission. Mums, dads and carers, by giving in to your child's dietary demands, you could be putting your kids' lives in danger. My mama bear heart hurts just watching that. Like, as if parents don't have enough to feel guilty about, now we're putting our kids' lives in danger by giving in to their dietary demands. Yeah, this deserves a whole other episode to really fully unpack and explain my stance on supporting kids who are considered too big or too small. But I will just say that if you think a show like Super Size versus Super Skinny is dangerous for us consenting adults, you bet your boots it's going to royally f up a lot of kids. Also, qualified pediatric dietitians will agree with me that it does not matter if a child is large or small, they all deserve to have a trustworthy relationship with their body, and that means not ever forcing food or withholding food. Your child will grow into the healthiest, happiest body for them if we let them take the lead to thrive. So despite our best intentions as parents, manipulation almost always makes it worse. If you want more information on how to raise a healthy, competent eater, definitely watch my video on the division responsibility right here. I also strongly suggest the book Helping Without Harming by Ellen Satter, which I'm gonna leave a link to below in the description. Bottom line, I truly cannot believe that this show was on the air for seven years. I mean, while the show's intentions may have been to bring attention to the possible health risks associated with extreme body weights at either end of the spectrum, it did not provide 
any scientific-based nutrition advice that viewers can actually use in their daily lives to help them in improving their health. If anything, as we saw from Reddit forums, this show only worsened viewers' relationship with food and their body and teaches viewers poor, unhealthy eating habits. And I don't know how many times I need to say this, but fat phobic comments and shame tactics are never going to be productive and help people improve their health long term. So on that note, this dietitian absolutely believes that this show should have never aired. And that is all for today, folks. Thanks again to Built Bar for sponsoring this video. If you liked it, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below if you have any other shows that you want to see me review. Subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.